Hi, my name is Stephen Turner, and I am the president of Gesha Galicia. I am here today to speak with Oren Kessler. Oren is a journalist and pol political analyst based in Tel Aviv. He has served as deputy director for research at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies in Washington, Middle East Research Fellow at the Henry Jackson Society in London, Arab Affairs Correspondent for the Jerusalem Post, and an editor and translator at the Haaretz English Edition. Raised in Rochester, New York, and Tel Aviv, he holds a BA in history from the University of Toronto and an MA in Diplomacy and Conflict Studies from the Reichman University. Kessler's work has appeared in media outlets such as Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and Politico. Palestine, 1936, The Great Revolt and the Roots of the Middle East Conflict is his first book. We usually on this podcast talk about issues related to Galicia. And although this topic does not directly relate to Galicia, it speaks of the reasons that the gates of Palestine were basically closed to Jews in 1939, which led to the word, the murder of so many of our Galician brethren in the Shoah. This podcast, is being recorded on Yom HaShoah. So this is a most pertinent topic for today. Let's get started. Welcome, Warren. Thank you very much for having me. Now, first off, I'd like to start by saying uh, you are a Galician. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> your Galician roots. Uh, sure, I'm happy to. I, I think I can go into more detail on this podcast than uh, ever before about my background. But uh, my my uh, my father was born uh, in Israel a month after the state was founded. My mother was born in Poland in 1949, uh, and I am, if you go back two or three generations, I am uh, three quarters Galicianer. So um, uh, specifically, if these names mean anything to your listeners, uh, I'm sure we, they will. <laughs> we hail from the, the Kesslers originally hail from a village called uh, Jurovno in the area of Lvov. Uh, wow. You, wow, you! <laughs> it's a small place, uh, and uh, and then the rest of uh, my family hails from places called uh, like Sniatin and uh, Borisov on my on my mother's side. Uh, so I hope to visit some of these places at some point. My my grandfather actually grew up mostly in Chernovitz in Bukovina, so right uh, right next to Galicia. Uh, and my dad has been there, but um, but I never have. I'd, I'd love oh, to. Oh, you have to go. You have to go. <laughs> Lviv is a great city and uh, as a base for you know when the when there's peace. Let yeah, there, yeah. Let, so let, I've heard. Let there just be peace. But maybe there's some Lansman listening now. <laughs> that will contact. Perhaps. You never know. Perhaps. That's right. Okay, so let's get started to talk about your book. Now, Palestinians today dwell on the Nakba of 1947 to 48 because they can blame Zionists for that. But to look at what happened in 36, 39 would require more soul searching. Do you think that is the reason that this uprising does not get much attention today? So it's it's interesting the the that kind of framing that you just presented of 48. Uh, versus 1936 to 39 is actually one that I quote in the book, and it's from an Arab professor by the name of Mustafa Kabha, who's based um, an Arab Israeli professor, who essentially makes that that argument, and he says uh, that uh, it's much easier, quote unquote, from a, a Palestinian perspective to to dwell on 48 because they perceive themselves as as the victims of of 47, 48, 49, the victims of Zionism, the victims of British imperialism. The victims of their Arab brethren who didn't uh, save them, in their view, uh, from the Zionists. But but dealing with thirty six to thirty nine from a Palestinian from an Arab perspective does require a lot more soul searching because among other things, uh, the uh, the violence inflicted by the Arab side in this period was directed initially at 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 Jews and at British uh, administrators and policemen and troops, uh, but fairly quickly devolved into kind of a convulsion of Arab uh, score settling and infighting, which I think is much more difficult, uh, much trickier in terms of sort of the, the Palestinian uh, narrative. 
Now, one of your main Palestinian Arab characters is Musa Alam, and he went to Cambridge. And he had a Jewish foster brother, but by 1920s, they weren't talking and they even avoided eye contact. Talk a little bit about him and what happened in that relationship. So I, I really tried to tell this story uh, through individual people. I wanted this to be a story, uh, a book that 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 revealed great momentous historical events through individual through individuals on all three sides. So that's Jewish, Arab, and British. Of course, this is the British mandate. The British are administering and ruling the country, and um, and one of the uh, one of the Arab characters through whom I do this is is this man whom you've mentioned, Musa Alami who was probably the first Palestinian Arab to attend Cambridge. He was a very well-educated, very brilliant man by, by all accounts. And he had many, uh, he was an Arab nationalist um, by, again, by all accounts, but he also had many Jewish friends and acquaintances, many British friends and acquaintances. One of his, uh, you mentioned the this foster brother he had as he was growing up. This is a, a kind of forgotten tradition in, uh, in, 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 in Palestine, in the land of Israel, I presume in, in much of the Eastern Mediterranean, this tradition of, uh, uh, of sort of nursing mothers, tr trading <laughs> children, as it were, and uh, bringing up uh, each other's children as, as sort of foster brothers. And indeed, Musa Alami had a, a Jewish foster brother um, in Jerusalem in his, in his youth. And then as the Zionist movement uh, after the Balfour Declaration and after the mandate began in 1920, 22, um, that sort of segregation, as it were, or self-separation between Jews and Arabs uh, really, um, really began, uh, it, it, the, the seeds of it began in the 20s and really uh, at the risk of jumping ahead here, uh, in 36 to 39, during this revolt, it, that segregation was really, that self-separation uh, was really cemented uh, in that period, and I would also say briefly that one of the one of the thread lines, the through lines that I I, I, I use in this book is the relationship between Musa Alami and David Ben Gurion. They had a, a decades long um, friendship, despite their very different political uh, aspirations, and they would meet regularly from the 30s all the way to the till uh, Ben Gurion's death in the 70s. In an atmosphere of um, of mutual respect, uh, and uh, and I, I was it was quite um, it was quite fascinating and quite encouraging to see this relationship that they that they had uh, despite those very deep differences between them. Right, and then when when they stopped meeting, I believe a Jew and a, Pal a Palestinian had not met for four decades afterwards. So it was actually, uh, yeah, I, sh I should specify, they, they met regularly until 48, and then there was a gap there of several decades, and they rekindled the relationship uh, in the, after the Six-Day War. Um, but uh, it is true that, uh, that Ben-Gurion met, uh, had a number of meetings with Musa Alami in the period that I'm writing about, and with George Antonius, who's this, uh, this Arab intellectual who wrote a book called The Arab Awakening in this period, a very influential book. Um, but then again, as the revolt um, erupted and uh, that sort of self-segregation became cemented and there was much more suspicion on both sides, I suppose. Uh, Ben-Gurion, it would be, as I write in the book, it was it would be several decades um, until he again engaged in any kind of substantive uh, peace negotiations with a prominent Arab. So from the late 30s, it was all the way uh, till the late 60s until anything like that uh, happened. Again, so that's just one of many ways in which I think this period is so pivotal uh, and such a sort of a, a crossroads in 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 the history of this conflict. Okay, and so prior to the ninth of uh, of nineteen twenty nine, the Jews were expecting a calamity. The British made a pronouncement that the Kotel belonged to the Arabs. Rioting ensued for several days after, and then there was a massacre in Hebron where 67 Jews were killed. Some Arabs opened their homes to high Jews and about 250 were saved. Tell us about what was going on during those days. Yeah, so it's, I, 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 I apologize, apologize if I'm jumping uh, around chronologically here, but uh, it is true that when I, 
oftentimes when I start telling people about, about this book and about this project, they say, oh, Hebron, you're writing about the Hebron massacre. Uh, and no, that's, um, that's, that's the, the core of my book begins seven years uh, after Hebron. The, the, the Hebron massacre was a, a, a very grim and gruesome uh, outburst of, of terrorism and of riots, as, as you mentioned. Um, 67 Jews were killed in Hebron and then uh, it, over over essentially one day, um, almost all of them were killed on one day. And then uh, there was another massacre a few days later in Sfat and other places. And in the end, uh, 133 Jews were killed, many of them in very gruesome circumstances. But I, I, I tend to view that sort of week of violence as as terrorism, as riots, but but that's all that I uh, view it as. I don't view it as a concerted nationalist uprising. In my view, the first time we see that, sort of an intifada, as we say these days, uh, would be in 1936. Uh, but the British, uh, the British, as they tended to do after this outburst of violence, they called a commission to determine who was behind it. Uh, and they laid a certain amount of blame at the feet of uh, Grand Mufti Haji Amin al-Husseini, who is a uh, major figure in my book, and of course notoriously would go on to ally with Hitler during the Second World War. Uh, they laid a certain amount of blame, but it was uh, sort of qualified blame, and it was not enough to remove him from his position. So I think it's important to remember that uh, it's, it was actually the British who appointed Haji Amin as the Mufti in the first place back in the early 20s, it was actually the Jewish High Commissioner of Palestine, uh, Herbert Samuel, who appointed him to that position. And it was really only in 1936, 37, with this revolt, that he really fell afoul of the British and actually had to flee uh, from the country and wouldn't be back for, for several uh, decades. So, yeah. So in that sense, 1929 is kind of a preview of 1936, but I, in my view, uh 1936 to 39 is is a much more um much more significant just in terms of uh the conflict uh itself just in terms of uh, sowing the seeds for the conflict as we know it today now you mentioned the mufti now there was a clan feud between the husseinis and the nashashibis what was the significance of this feud yeah that's right this is um the main two camps uh, in the Palestinian Arab uh, community at this in this period, and really for for decades uh, previous, perhaps even centuries, uh, was well. Let's say decades. Let's say decades. There were basically five or six um, prominent Arab families in Jerusalem, and the most prominent were the Husseinis and the Nashashibis, uh, and the other families tended to ally with one camp or the other. And so the Husseinis, of course, represented uh, by by the Grand Mufti and others, uh, were known as the more radical, more nationalist camp, and the Nashashibis were generally considered more moderate, more willing to work with the British and the Jews. They also, to be honest, had a reputation for um, corruption and for um, being quite bribable, uh, but uh, Raghav Nashashibi was a former mayor of Jerusalem, and um, and it's one of those it's one of those great sort of what ifs of this period and of and of the history of this land and of this conflict of what what would have happened had the Nashashibis been in power instead of uh, the Husseinis? What would have happened had the had the British chosen a Nashashibi as Grand Mufti instead of uh, Haji Amin? And uh, of course, we'll, we'll we'll never know. But uh, the the when the British, for example, uh, suggest propose uh, partitioning the land in 1937 for the very first time, the Nashashibis uh, actually privately accept this. Uh, they they indicate that they're they're willing to to go along with this. And this was uh, you know, there were mayors of prominent Arab cities who were Nashashibi aligned, the mayors of uh, Jaffa, Haifa, even places like Tulkaram and Nablus that we today associate with militancy and terrorism. Uh, they went along with this. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the man whose, whose word mattered more than anyone's was, uh, was Haj Amin al-Husseini, and he struck a very intransigent, intransigent line throughout this whole period. And, um, Certainly, the Jews paid the price for that, but I I believe and I argue that that the Arabs of Palestine uh, very much paid a price for 
for uh, the grand muftis and transigents as well. You argue that very convincingly, I might add. Okay, now you well, say thank you. that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> now you say there were not many differences between Zev Jabotinsky and Chaim Weizmann's view of a Jewish state, but Jabotinsky had more candor to say what he really felt. Tell me, talk to us, talk to me about that. So I, I, it's um, it's interesting because they, David, even in this period, David Ben Gurion is the the almost uncontested leader of the Jews of of the land of Israel of Mandate Palestine, but he's basically unknown outside of outside of uh, the Holy Land. The, the, at this time, the the face and the muscle of Zionism is Chaim Weizmann, the head of the World Zionist Organization, uh, and he had been the he had he had occupied that role really since since the Balfour Declaration uh, and really all the way up to to, to 47, uh, 48. Um, when Ben Gurion became much more prominent uh, internationally, and Weizmann was a very charming man. He managed to um, charm countless Brits and non-Jews and non-Zionists into a more sympathetic view of the Zionist experiment, simply through the again the, the strength of his personal charm and and powers of persuasion. Weizmann was born in Russia in a in a shtetl, but uh, had spent much of his adult life in in Britain as a chemist in Manchester. And uh, and he was very intimately familiar with British ways and very well connected in the, in the the among the British elites. Uh, but Weizmann was a, a gradualist. Weizmann uh, was, of course, a committed Zionist. It was it was his, his passion and his love. But he he took the long view and he was an Anglophile. He believed that under British um, supervision and support, and sponsorship, the Jewish national home could expand and grow. And then at some point in the future, perhaps there could be, hopefully there could be a Jewish state, but but that would take time. Uh, Jabotinsky was much more impatient. Jabotinsky, um, Jabotinsky spoke openly, almost from the beginning of a Jewish state. He said, this is the goal. This is really what all of my Zionist comrades believe, whether they say it or not, this is what they're what they're hoping and working for is a Jewish state. Um, it needs to happen now because the Jews need to get out of Europe, um, and there's no time to waste. So it was really it was it was a difference uh, in style, um, I think, uh, and just sensibility. But um, but really, particularly as as the as the mid '30s gave way to the late '30s, Weizmann's uh, tone and his rhetoric. It starts to sound a lot more like Jabotinsky's. The, the urgency rises. You know, he's he's increasingly banging on the table at places like the Peel Commission and the St. James Conference of 1939. He's peel, he's banging on the table and 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 uh, throwing around the figure of six million. It's actually quite chilling to read that he says six million Jews need a home. Six million Jews need a home. It's quite prescient and quite chilling. Um, and so that sense of urgency. Um, really grows with with Weizmann as as uh, as that fateful year of 1939 approaches. And now here is the key point of fr friction between the Jews and the Arabs. Jews felt Europeanized. Let's remember this is before the large immigration of Mizrahi and Arab Jews, while Arabs felt they were part of the Middle East. Jews felt they could improve the economy and help the Arabs, but the Arabs felt that attitude was condescending and they resented the Jews. How did these kinds of attitudes contribute to the problem? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, there's, a, there's a quote uh, in, in the book from, from Musa Alami, who we, who we mentioned earlier, which he tells Ben-Gurion in the mid thirties, he says, you know, I prefer that this land remain underdeveloped uh, for a hundred years, as long as we Arabs can be the ones who who develop it, and this is actually hearing this is actually a turning point for Ben Gurion, and he repeats this this line Ben Gurion does uh, over and over to, to to his colleagues to kind of explain to them how he's he's come to understand the Arab position better. He basically comes around to the idea in this period of the mid thirties, mid to late thirties, that uh, the idea that the Jews could could simply uh, show bring the Arabs uh, show the Arabs how to improve their agricultural yield or how to drain swamps that those kind of material benefits simply would not uh, suffice that the Arabs had nationalist aspirations that they uh, felt 
that the Jews were 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 um, were coming in in larger numbers than the country could absorb. That things were moving too quickly, and that the country was incre was 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 uh, becoming less and less an Arab country as they saw it. And Ben Gurion essentially um, recognizes this at the time, and indeed the Brits. Uh, recognize this. They they write as much in the famous Peel report of 1937, in which they they say that uh, that uh, you know an irrepressible conflict has erupted between two national communities, and it can't be solved by any kind of economic uh, measures. And that's indeed when they first proposed the two-state solution, because they determined that only a quote-unquote clean cut uh, can uh, can remove this 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 wound. Um, and it's it's true what you said that the Jews were overwhelmingly European at this at this period, apart from some Sephardic Jews in, in Jerusalem. And uh, I mean, there was a significant Sephardic population in Jerusalem and Tiberias and elsewhere. And there was a Yemenite community in Tel Aviv. But the vast majority of uh, Jews in, in the land of Israel were European at this point. It's actually really fascinating to, to note how little the Zionist leaders even discuss the Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews. The, the whole Zionist enterprise is really aimed at transporting the persecuted Jews of Europe back uh, to, to the Holy Land. Now, in May of 1936, Tel Aviv opened a new port, and the Jews were ecstatic. What made them so happy? Yeah, Ben, ben Gurion uh, described uh, the opening of Tel Aviv port as a second Balfour Declaration. That's how euphoric he was. This was at the very beginning of the Arab Revolt, and the Arab Revolt began with uh, acts of, of violence and, and murder, but very soon uh, were matched by political demands. Um, Hajj Amin, the Grand Mufti, declared that uh, the Arabs would be striking, that there would be a general strike, uh, that they would not be engaging with the British or Jewish economies in any way. Uh, uh, and um, until three demands were met, namely uh, stopping all Jewish immigration, a ban on land sales because very many wealthy and prominent Arabs were selling land to Jews at inflated prices, even while they railed against that practice in public. Uh, and then the third was a, it was was creating a, a legislative assembly, a sort of uh, popular representation to reflect the, the demographics of the country, which were still at least two thirds Arab. And Haj Amin said, this strike will continue until these demands are met. And it actually lasted six months, which is even to this day, one of the longest general strikes anywhere in history. And so Jaffa port uh, closed down completely. They were the, the, the port wasn't in operation. This is May 1936, uh, April, May. And Ben Gurion approached the British uh, with the request or demand, <laughs> demand, depending on how you look at it, to open a, a port for the Jews. And the British agreed. Uh, the British agreed to open to let the Jews open a port in North Tel Aviv. This is the, the port, the Namal that we know today. Maybe many of your listeners have had a coffee or a dinner or a drink at the at the Nama, at the port, which is a lovely area. Uh, and uh, this is Ben Gurion was was ecstatic. He, he viewed this as you know the Jews opening to to the world. This is this is creating a Jewish sea. Um, yeah, it was a huge a huge coup for the for the for the Jews. And really, this is one of the sort of one of the, one of the takeaways and the themes of the book from from, from the Jewish side is. The way in which Ben Gurion and the Zionist leadership really turned adversity into advantage, and so the Jews paid paid a tremendous price in in, in blood and in treasure. Five hundred Jews are are killed in this revolt. These are massive numbers. These are numbers we didn't see until the Second Intifada, and this is at a time when the Jewish population is, of course, much smaller. Uh, so, despite that tremendous pain that they suffered, the Jews make massive gains economically, uh, militarily, which we can get into. Um, in terms of uh, settlement and in terms of just political organization um, in this period. And really, I argue that it's in this period leading up to 39 that the Jews create the, the, the basis and the springboard for the state that they would create uh, 10 years later. Now, I learned a lot reading your book. And one of the things that really surprised me that I learned was that in the mid-30s, the League of Nations was really giving the Britons, the Brits a hard time but constantly giving in to the Arabs. The, the League of Nations is a lot friendlier to the Jews than the UN has become, uh, except for the partition vote in 47. But you want to get into that? Yeah, it's really fascinating. The, the, the League of Nations was, 
particularly the the League of Nations had something called the Permanent Mandates Commission, and they were really uh, the, the the British were uh, administering the mandate on behalf of the League of Nations Mandate Commission, on behalf of the international community as it was perceived at the time. And this Mandates Commission uh, and the League generally in Geneva was considered uh, pro-Zionist. Uh, the uh, the heads of this Mandate Commission, almost all of them, were considered sympathetic to Zionism. Um, uh, of course, the mandate itself was an instrument of of the League and. Um, and uh, it's it's we can speculate as to why they were uh, so pro-Zionist, perhaps because they viewed the, the 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 Palestine mandate as as a league project and they wanted to see it uh, succeed. I think there was also there was also a tremendous amount, I think, a significant amount of of of, of support in Europe generally for the Zionist project in some way, shape, or form. There was a tremendous. Let's not forget that the Balfour Declaration was not only issued by Britain, but it had previously received. The support of the U.S. It had received uh, the Wilson administration had indicated its support to the British for the Balfour Declaration before it was issued. Um, the Balfour Declaration had the support of the other allies in the war in World War One, uh, and of course, the Balfour Declaration was enshrined in that mandate text that was given by the League of Nations. It says right there in the mandate text in the Constitution of the Mandate, if you like, that uh, Britain shall facilitate the Jewish national home and shall facilitate quote unquote close settlement of the land. So there was a, a, a fairly wide buy-in to some form of, uh, of of the Zionist project in this uh, period. And um, it's it, it really is it's quite fascinating to to hear. And indeed, uh, when uh, again, I'm jumping ahead here again, so my apologies, but it, spoiler alert, in 1939, uh, the British um, issue the white paper, which crit severely curtails the whole Zionist experiment. And one of their main concerns is that the League of Nations is not going to approve this, that the League of Nations is going to consider it a betrayal of, of Britain's promises and the League's commitment to the Balfour Declaration. Uh, and indeed, at, which it was, and and indeed that happens. The League of Nations actually rejects the white paper, but uh, we can we can get to that a bit later. A bit later. Okay. Now, now you mentioned the two state solution being proposed by the Peel Commission when they said that it, that it came in thirty seven that the Arabs and Jews just were not getting along and they had to be separated, and the Jews were they didn't like the boundaries of their supposed state that the. Peel Commission was going to give them, but they were pretty happy with it. But all the Arabs rejected it, except King Abdullah was first a little bit okay with it, but with pressure, he he turned out against it too. But uh, do you want to you want to talk a little bit about the reactions to the two communities by of the Peel report? By yeah, yeah. So the Peel the Peel Commission came to to Palestine in late thirty six prompted directly by, by the Arab revolt and the demands made by the Arab leadership to, to examine their grievances. And so they, they, they came over acting in the name of the king. This is Britain's highest level commission of inquiry, uh, acting in the name of the very short-lived king, Edward VIII, who famously abdicated. Um, and, uh, and they spent several months in the country and they write a 400 page report, which uh, if any of your listeners have uh, you know, uh, the next three, four weeks free, they should absolutely read because it's a very good read. Uh, but it's it's mainly remembered by history for the last 10 or 15 pages in which they recommend a, a partition plan, a two state solution. Um, and uh, there's raucous debate in the Zionist, uh, in, within the Zionist leadership over this. There are opponents to this plan, both on the Zionist right and the Zionist left, Shabotinsky rejects this plan out of hand, but there are prominent people on the Zionist left who are also opposed to this partition plan. Um, but the two people who matter most, namely David Ben-Gurion and Chaim Weizmann, are both ecstatic, and they don't quite reveal that much publicly. They don't indicate quite how ecstatic they are. But I've read their diaries and their letters, and they are euphoric. They, they, both, uh, they both consider this a foothold. They, they both consider this to be not the last word territorially, but 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 a foothold and uh, and and a sanctuary, uh, a refuge for the persecuted Jews of Europe. Um, and they are they are they're thrilled. And ultimately, their word carries the day. 
they have they have a vote in the Zionist uh, Congress, but their 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 side carries the day, and the Zionists indicate their approval of this plan. Uh, on the Arab side, as you mentioned, Emir Abdullah in Transjordan publicly supported this plan. Uh, it was in his interest to support the plan because it's often forgotten that actually the Peel partition proposal called for the Arab part of Palestine to be attached in some way to Transjordan. So it directly benefited him. But he was also affiliated with the Nashashibi uh, camp in, in Palestine. He was, the, he was, they were considered aligned. And indeed, those uh, Nashashibi leaders who I mentioned earlier, they supported the partition plan. They didn't do so publicly as Abdullah did, but they let it be known to the British that they supported this plan. And it was only after the Mufti indicated his uncompromising opposition to this plan that the Nashashibis and indeed Emir Abdullah said, oh, actually, uh, we don't support this. And this is really a, a, a theme and a recurring motif in this period and in this book of the Mufti and his, uh, in his intransigent way, uh, coercing his fellow Arabs, either through threats or through actual violence, into towing his very uh, extreme line. Right. Now, uh, the, the, the uh, Great Britain wanted to arrest the Mufti, and he had to hide out in Al-Aqsa for five months, and much of what we seeing now, because, because the, Brit, the, the, the Britain police did not want to go into Al-Aqsa and make an arrest. And then one night, he, in the, I think in the middle of the night, he snuck out, and he, he snuck out into Lebanon after five months. And uh, this, is, this is when the revolt was, was getting started. In, 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 in as a full formal revolt or an, an intifada as we would as you called it and uh, Britain quickly started to retreat uh, Neville Chamberlain who was famous uh, we in the United States when we study history we look at Neville Chamberlain was his appeasement uh, of Hitler uh, in Munich but he was starting to appease the Arabs and they started to pull back uh, from from the recommendations of the Peel Commission, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the Peel Commission makes its uh, partition recommendation in in the summer of uh, thirty seven, and as mentioned, the Mufti rejects it. And very shortly after that, uh, I should mention that the the Arab Revolt had been sort of suspended pending the results of the Peel Commission acts of violence. Uh, were suspended for the most part. The strike was suspended, but after this recommendation is made and the Mufti rejects it, quite soon after, there's a man by the name of Lewis Andrews, a, who's the, the, uh, the governor of Galilee. He's a, a Christian Zionist, which was fairly, extremely unusual among the British administration that he was uh, pro-Zionist. Uh, he was an Australian, actually. Uh, he spoke very good Arabic, very good Hebrew, which was very unusual. He is assassinated on his 41st birthday, while attending church in Nazareth. And this is the opening shot of the second, much bloodier phase of the revolt. And this time around, uh, the British are taking no prisoners. They, uh, they well, actually, they take quite a few prisoners. But the British uh, are determined to really uh, show a heavy-handed response this time in a way that they hadn't previously. And, some, and now the Mufti is a wanted man. As you mentioned, he flees to Al-Aqsa. This is one of many parallels that we see today, a lot of the, the a lot of the events and the dynamics of the late 30s uh, oftentimes seem to be ripped from the headlines of today. But the Mufti flees to Al-Aqsa because he believes correctly that the British will not dare offend Muslim sensibilities by uh, pursuing him there. He's there for five months. And then he dressed as a Bedouin, although some reports say dressed as a woman. He flees to Jaffa port and from there to Beirut. And that's where he uh, that's where he spends the next few years uh, and continues kind of pulling the strings of the revolt uh, from there. Uh, and so the British engage in some very, very heavy handed measures at this point. A lot of the more, the most controversial, controversial me uh, measures that the and methods that the IDF employs today uh, actually have their origins in this period and in the British army methods and in, uh, used in this period and even the legal basis thereof. Of course, Israel inherited much of British law when it was established. The IDF is modeled on the British army in many ways, uh, but the British army in this period engaged 
uh, in in practices, which even the most uh, shall we say uh, even even uh, Ben Gvir and company would not uh, contemplate some of these measures, such as uh, collective punishment was simply part of the game. For example, if a bomb was laid on a highway, the British would come in. They would take the, take out the village headman, the Mukhtar, ask him who was responsible. And if he couldn't tell them, they would simply start demolishing homes. There were 2,000 homes demolished uh, in this period. There were 100 Arabs were hanged in this period. Uh, massive amounts of um, arrests and, uh, and, and simply uh, killings and uh, you know, curfews. And there's even a, a security barrier built along the northern border because so much militancy is coming from the, the Mufti's hideout in Lebanon. And there's a clear parallel there with the, the West Bank uh, security barrier. Uh, but again, getting back to this idea of turning, for the Jews, turning adversity into advantage, what the British do at this period, in this period, they realize they're unable to quash the revolt on their own. The war clouds are, are gathering above Europe, and they aren't able to send large numbers of troops from the UK. And so what do they do? They agree to a very long-standing Jewish demand to arm and train the Jews in large numbers. And that's what they do. They arm and train and pay 15 to 20,000 Jews to join uh, what is called the Jewish supernumerary police. In Hebrew, we say notrim. Um, and, uh, and again, these are nominally uh, or officially members of the Palestine police, namely under British control, but it's fairly clear to everyone that they're ultimately answerable to the Haganah, which is the main Jewish uh, armed self-defense force in this period. And this is really the period in which the Haganah goes from being a glorified network of night watchmen to the seed of a Jewish army, uh, the seed of the IDF. And it's really uh, thanks, uh, it's thanks to, to the British in large part. So I think uh, my Israeli friends have a lot of, uh, I've, I've noticed a lot of Israelis have certain resentments towards the British for, for, for the white paper and for, and for things that happened subsequently. But uh, I think it's often forgotten that it was actually the British who in many ways uh, sowed the seeds for, for the IDF. Well, you actually predicted my next question because I was going <laughs> to mention how that this is the time when the Haganah came, came into existence, but the Haganah and the, and the right wing, didn't, they didn't know, they didn't, as of now, they didn't agree with how to handle things always. And uh, Jabotinsky's crews were a little bit more revengeful of Arabs at the time. And the Haganah was very much against that. And then uh, there was a, a, a young boy named Shlomo Ben Yosef, who was uh, arrested by the Britons for some actions that he took. And he was executed. And there was a mass movement of the Jews protesting this execution before it happened. And they put a lot of pressure not to have it happen. And then when he, and it was very moving how you described this, this young boy and how he wasn't afraid to die. And, and, uh, and Jabotinsky, who was not in Palestine at that time, uh, tried so hard, and that they, they, he was said to be at, after learning of the execution that he completely became distraught and was crying terribly. Do you want to describe a little bit that scene of the Shlomo Ben Yosef execution and what led up to it? Yeah, so the 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 Jabotinskyite uh, revisionist counterpart to the Haganah, the sort of dissident organization, was called the Irgun. Uh, the Irgun Tzvai Leumi, the National Military Organization, and they took a very different uh, approach uh, in the face of Arab violence. The Haganah stuck to what's called in Hebrew Havlaga, self-restraint, and they wanted to show the British that they could be trusted with weapons in the hopes that the British would include them in the security apparatus, which, as I mentioned, they very much did. The Irgun had a very different approach, and particularly from 37 onwards, late 37 onwards, when really the revolt was, was blazing at, 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 at uh, very, uh, very strongly, very, very, very viciously. Um, from that period, they basically, their, their, their approach was an eye for an eye, that they wanted to show the Arabs that uh, Jewish blood could not be shed in vain, that there was a price for Jewish blood. They thought that uh, essentially retaliatory attacks would have a deterrent effect and so what we see in this period, 
uh, again and again, unfortunately, is uh, members of the Irgun you know, laying bombs in Arab vegetable markets and 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 doing the sort of things that uh, that the Arabs were, were were doing to the Jews. And one member and the the revisionist youth movement was and is uh, called Beitar. And uh, there was a young Beitar member, not that young, about I think about twenty, uh, by the name of Shlomo Ben Yosef, who was a fairly recent immigrant from Poland. From Lutsk, and uh, he was living up in Roshpina in northern Palestine, now northern Israel. And he and a couple of friends uh, fired uh, uh, fired a couple of shots at an Arab bus, and they bungled it terribly, and nothing happened. The bus continued on its way, uh, but they were found by the British police. And Ben Yosef's two um, accomplices, if you like, his two partners. Uh, found various ways to get out of it. One of them lied about his age, and um, and the other essentially was shown to be mentally unsound, even though it's, he probably was not. Uh, ben Yosef also could have gotten out of punishment, but he wanted to make an example of himself. He wanted to show the British and the world that uh, that the Jews were not afraid of death, uh, that Jewish blood uh, could not be shed in vain, that the Jews were taking matters into their own hands, and that they were not afraid of death. And he basically rejected all efforts to spare his life, including some very frenzied efforts by Jabotinsky. Uh, and the British hanged him. He was the only Jew executed by the British uh, during this revolt, and I believe during the entire mandate, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he was indeed the first Jew executed by the authorities in the land of Israel in 2000 years. Uh, and so, and I have his, his, uh, his handwritten letters in, in Hebrew, not, sometimes a, a little bit imperfect Hebrew. Um, and it's, it's, it's very moving. It's very moving. He went to the gallows uh, singing Hatikva and, um, and, and praising Jabotinsky, saying, long live Jabotinsky. And, uh, and yeah, and he was... As I mentioned, the Arab, the, the British hanged 100 Arabs during this revolt, but they, they only hanged one, one Jew, and that was uh, Shlomo Ben Yosef. Okay, now the rise of Hitler caused desperate times to try to and get Jews out of Germany. Now, Ben Gurion said what I thought was an absolutely horrible remark that really upset me when I read that. This book. Mm. You probably know which one I'm, I'm going to refer to, but I'm going to. I think so. <laughs> I'm going to read it now. If I, he said, if I knew it was possible to save all the children in Germany by transporting them to England, but only half of them by transporting to Palestine, I would choose the second. Because we face not only the reckoning of those children, but the historical reckoning of the Jewish people. Like every Jew, he hoped to see to save each member of his tormented people whenever possible. But nothing takes precedence over saving the Hebrew nation in its land. Now, true, he didn't know what was about to happen in its scale, but he knew what was coming. To me, this is an atrocious statement. I understand what he was trying to say, but I mean, please, uh, this hurt. This hurt to read. Yeah, I um I'm trying to recall. Uh yeah, I'm checking my manuscript here to see when he made that uh comment. Yeah, this was I, I believe this was before he knew the uh the scale. This was before the Holocaust, if I'm if I'm before remembering the, correctly. About the yeah. time that he did the transport to London. Exactly, exactly. About that's the time that, that. that's right. That's right. So yeah, I it's it's certainly it's chilling to read. We have the as you, as you indicated, we have the wisdom of, of hindsight and knowing what was coming. Uh, but Ben Gurion, he, he, he Ben Gurion had had the, a brain like a like a calculator. It's really something to read his even his his remarks in meetings, even impromptu remarks uh, in the minutes of the various Zionist meetings. He really it's it's as if his, his impromptu remarks barely differed from his written remarks. He would say, okay. Aleph, we need to do this. Uh, Aleph, subclause number number one, we need to do this and we need to do that, but we can't do this. And it's just, he's, it's, he's so incredibly methodical. Uh, and with no sense of humor at all. With no, by most accounts, uh, no sense of humor. 
um, perhaps these days we would have diagnosed him with some kind of uh, <laughs> condition. I say that uh, I say that jokingly, but uh, he was he was a, a remarkable man. He was obviously a man who who who, who accomplished historic things. Um, but he he really was extraordinarily practical and pragmatic and um, and and results oriented. And that's why after the Shoah, he, uh, you know, he the, the well, we're perhaps getting ahead of ourselves, but the, the reparations debate in Israel, he viewed uh, from Germany, he viewed that entirely through a pragmatic, practical lens. It's not that he was cold or unmoved by by the sufferings of of the Jews of the of, of those killed and those who survived but he was an extremely practical person and he, he was committed to the Zionist project and uh it's not that he would do whatever possible to advance that project but he would go quite far in that uh direction um at almost any cost okay so now, now let's get to um the start of the white paper of 39. Malcolm McDonald was an early supporter of the Jews, but when he was tasked to study the situation in Palestine, it didn't work out so well for the Jews. Appeasement of the Arabs became a definite policy. And uh, you want to describe a little bit of um, Malcolm McDonald's background and how he came to, the, to do what he did? Uh, yeah, absolutely. He, Malcolm McDonald was the son of um, was the son of uh, Ramsey McDonald, who was the first Labour Prime Minister, and um, and both father and son were actually quite uh, supportive of of the Zionist enterprise. Um, but uh, Malcolm McDonald, the younger McDonald, was named by Neville Chamberlain as his colonial secretary in 1938. The younger Macdonald was only about 36 at the time. He was quite green, quite untested politically. And uh, he was a loyal member of the Chamberlain uh, government. And the Chamberlain government followed an appeasement policy. Okay. Now, the great rebel... And, and, and oh, go ahead. sorry, I, I, I just saw the clock uh, ran out of time, so I wanted to make sure... Uh, we weren't cut off here, but uh, no, we're not, we're not going to be cut off. Okay, great. So, uh, so yeah, so so Malcolm McDonald was 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 uh, was uh, committed to this appeasement policy, as was was the rest of the Chamberlain government, and that policy extended not just to Hitler and Mussolini, but it also extended to the Middle East. And the British leadership was extremely worried that if and when a war uh, broke out, a world war that uh, Arab, but particularly Muslim opinion would be on the British side. They were particularly worried about the large Muslim population of India. And they were not, they were extremely worried that if the Muslims of India were angry about Palestine, that they wouldn't be on board uh, with, with the allies, with the British uh, in the war. So MacDonald calls uh, a conference. The British had an insatiable appetite for conferences and committees and commissions. And he calls this conference at St. James's Palace in London. He invites uh, leaders of the Yishuv in Palestine. He invites Arab leaders. And long story short, the result of this is the famous or infamous white paper, the McDonald white paper, in which uh, Jewish immigration is severely curtailed. Uh, I should mention that in 1935, 60,000 Jews immigrated to Palestine. And uh, as a result of this white paper, a cap was put on Jewish immigration at 75,000 total over five years. And this is already at mid-1939. So, of course, the Jews need a refuge more than any other time in history. But immigration is capped at that number, 75,000 over five years, after which any further immigration will be contingent upon Arab consent. And, of course, it was clear to everyone that Arab consent would not be forthcoming. Uh, and then after that point, says the white paper, uh, Palestine would exist as an independent state. They don't say independent Arab state, but again, a country that is at least 60% Arab is a de facto Arab state. So this is really considered not only a reneging on the Peel partition plan, but a reneging on the Balfour Declaration itself. And it's considered a huge betrayal by the Jews and, and indeed by many across the world. 
And there are some quite moving, very moving scenes of from that I that I found in my research from August 1939, the Zionist uh, Congress in uh, in Geneva. And this is already mid to late August, and uh, and news comes in of the Hitler-Stalin non-aggression pact, and the Jews there, the Jewish delegates are simply stunned because it means there's no barrier to Hitler expanding eastward if the Soviets aren't willing to fight him. Uh, and you have and the the con the conference the Congress closes uh, prematurely. They they wrap everything up. They rise to their feet. They sing Hatikva. Many of them with tears in their eyes. Uh, there's some very moving speeches. And then uh, most of those delegates to this Congress from Eastern Europe are never seen again because a, a, a week later the war breaks out. And of course we know uh, we know how that uh, how that ended up. So. Um, yeah, so the, the white paper is really, it's one of these huge what ifs. What if, you know, I think it's probably too far to say, as Ben Gurion did later, that had had the white paper not been passed, had Palestine been partitioned in 37, that 6 million could have been saved. I think perhaps, uh, I'm not sure Palestine could have absorbed 6 million Jews in this in this period, particularly in that in that very small country that, that the British offered the Jews. But I think it was Golda Meir who said, that uh, if not for the white paper, uh, and if, if partition had gone through, that hundreds of thousands of Jews can, could be saved. I think that's plausible. Uh, and it's it's really one of those tragic uh, what ifs. Forcing the British retreat from the Balfour Declaration was the Arab uprising's singular undeniable achievement. But the political, social, military, and economic fabric of Arab Palestine was savagely, irreparably torn. And after the 39 white paper, Chaim Weizmann visited Malcolm McDonald and said it in reference to his father, who, like you said, was a great friend of the Jews, that he must be turning over his, in his grave at his son's breach of faith. And Malcolm McDonald said, as you quoted, that this is the cruelest thing that has ever been said to him. And it was spoken by one of the kindliest of men. I realized, he said then, that he had come to hate and despise me. I absolutely respected him for hating me and never lost my admiration for him. But it was very sad. And that, that was very touching to read that because... Mm. Yeah. And he, he said at one point that that as he was writing the, writing the white paper, he had tears in his eyes as he was writing it, but that he 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 had to be practical and not emotional. Yeah, I think um, the comment about the tears in his eyes was written retroactively, retrospectively. So I don't want to be cynical, but I, I'm not I'm not sure that was the case i've i've read all of the back and forth at I the agree, time agree. Yeah. <laughs> i read all of the back and forth at the time between mcdonald and 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 his fellow members of the cabinet and he thought this was the right way to go he was he's very he was hard headed about the whole thing i'm i'm not saying he wasn't uh it sounds like after the fact he was conscious stricken by what he had done uh it's uh, um you know it's not that he couldn't sleep at night but his, in in his memoirs you can you can sense he actually he, uh, if I could read a, a, a brief quote here, he says, he, he, he later wrote the following. Uh, the only point over which I criticize myself is that perhaps I should have held out for a higher figure of Jewish immigration. I have sometimes felt conscious stricken, but honestly, I did my darndest. I'm not saying the white paper was right. All I'm saying is that this was the reason for it. And I'm damned if I can see what else could have been done. Uh, I think that's a more accurate portrayal of his emotions than uh, again. I don't want to be cynical, but I just I I think they thought he thought it was the right move at the time, and then I think later on he he did have serious uh, pangs of pangs of conscience about it. Now, even as horrible as the white paper was for the Jews, the Mufti the Mufti still rejected it, but most Arabs were happy. But the white paper did not resolve. Britain's Palestine predicament, but it did postpone its reckoning. That, after all, was the objective, providing the diplomatic backing that combined with military force and the Arabs' own dissension that would bring the Great Revolt to a close 
before the start of the World War. And that's, that's, that goal was accomplished because it postponed everything and it let Britain concentrate on fighting the war and uh, the Germans were able to concentrate on killing the Jews who had no place to go. And that, that's the tragedy that we see today. Okay, I want to conclude here by saying, by reading this passage, and you could comment on it. Okay, talking about the uprising. You, you say, what is relevant here, but generally overlooked, is the reality that the Arabs of Palestine had effectively already lost the war, and with, with it, most of its country a decade in advance. Yeah, I... I, I... I, I make that argument in in the book that really, uh, even yeah, by 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 thirty nine, by the end of the revolt and and the eve of the Second World War, really, as I mentioned, the Jews had really created that that military, economic, political uh, springboard, even just the motivational and psychological kind of coherence that they that they um, that they were able to achieve in this in this period. Um, that 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 proved the basis for their their triumph uh, a decade on. I'm not saying the entire 48 war was won a decade in advance. You still, I'm talking about the the uh, the 48 war was divided into two phases, right? You had the civil war at first between the Jews and Arabs of, of Palestine, uh, and then the Arab invasion afterwards. And really, that first phase in which that final reckoning arrived between Jews and Arabs over the, the fate of the Holy Land, I argue that. The Jews had had uh, had were so consolidated uh, in this period by the results of of the Arab revolt, and the Arabs were so torn, so crippled by the revolt, uh, by British heavy handedness, by but in but by by but but also by by um, by infighting and by the bad blood that was so. That it's uh, spread over Arab society. Huge numbers of men are are in prison or dead or in exile. There were huge waves of uh, refugee uh, of refugee movement outside of the country. There were probably twenty thousand Arabs who, who took refuge in Beirut. So this is another uh, in Beirut alone. This is another precursor to 1948. The uh, the Arab leadership is in exile, right? So Arab society is just the entire social fabric is is torn, um, and so you have a crippled Arab society in Palestine, you have a very highly motivated Jewish society in Palestine, which is even more motivated by the knowledge of all the hor horrors that their brethren have inflict have suffered in Europe and the, and the need for them to find a home in the land of Israel. And so, uh, and so that's the argument that I, that I make in this book, that many of those features of the conflict that we, that we view as having begun in 1948 actually, uh, actually began a decade earlier. Well, thank you very much for taking the time, the time out from your busy book tour. I urge all who listen and were intrigued by this conversation to go out and buy the book. I promise you won't be disappointed. We'll have a link to the book in the podcast homepage. And uh, best of luck with it. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Stephen. I, I really enjoyed this. Me too.